go after all those codes that are just, you know, always in the face. You have the dimples of the eyes and the nose. But I think that they come from the unconsciousness. Because most of all, they're just very intuitive. And I try to keep that part relevant in the painting because they're, the paintings are trying to explain something that I can't explain or I can't articulate it. So I have to mediate it through brush strokes. And in order to do that, I have to translate an idea I have, but that idea I can't really pinpoint. As you can see, the sketches are also pretty terrible. <laughs> I work, mostly work with coordinates in some way, or like um, coordinates for myself, like the circles and lines in order to know where to put things, but I never want to plan it too much because I think that sort of kills the painting. So where these faces come from, I really don't know. Somewhere deep down in my <laughs> subconscious. And yeah, maybe there are people I've met. That would be pretty incredible, like when you dream. Apparently, everyone you see in your dream, even the people you don't know, are people you have seen or met on the street. So maybe that's what I'm doing. Next face. Mostly, when I want to do a painting like this, or just any painting in particular, I, um, I start out with this blurry image in my head that comes from a feeling or a subjective experience and then I can't always really tell where it comes from. It can be very momentary, maybe something I've thought about for a long period of time. Um, but it always has this mood or feeling that I want to capture. And I worked a lot with how we react when we are in crowds or crowd mentality and breaking up the individual. And I mean, those themes have to come from a place that uh, I can't really explain always. <laughs> So I have to translate it in my head. The thing that come down to painting is being a translator of some sort. Because you want, in the end, you're always dependent on the one seeing your artwork. You always have to work together with the viewer. And um, in order to do that the best, I have to leave some space for them to enter the painting, if that makes sense they have to be able to access it and that's mostly where the idea for this painting comes from that I wanted to have these crowds but I want the viewer who see the crowds to access the crowd because there are all these little moments happening within the painting that are dragging on different emotions and feelings I mean, they all have their individual character and they're not always interacting with each other. They're just existing in this painting. And what I mean by little moments is that they all carry this individual emotion or expression. And that part, I never really decide. I never really plan out for how the people to look or how they're brows should be folded or their eyes should be open wide. It's something that happens quite intuitively. Sometimes I also find myself mimicking them while I'm painting them. In the end, when I put them together, they become this one mass and they are perceived as one mass. And 
their individual facial expressions sometimes may come off as like a mask or mimicking rather than real emotions. But then when you look closer and you start inspecting each individual face, you have, I don't know how many faces there are here, but you have like a hundred different little portraits. They all come out of the state of mind that me getting lost while painting. I mean, there passes a certain amount of time, um, and then you get into this state where you're not really consciously aware of what you're painting. It sounds a little obscure, but it only happens when I really allow myself not to think too much or to care too much to think about if I did something wrong in the painting or what other people might think or I start judging my brush strokes, thinking that it looks incorrect and that that word even exists when I'm painting. It's pretty, you don't really want that because as soon as I start analyzing it too much, I, I'm not in that space. I can't access that space of, of a state where I can start translating the, the image in my head because I start interfering. And it's not something I can interfere in because if I try to put logic to it or like try and draw it down on a piece of paper, I can't because then I lose it. So it has to happen while I'm painting. And that's what I mean with getting lost. You have to stop judging the painting as you go and just allow them to be what they are. And then you can always go back, of course, and change some things. But in the end, you mostly don't go back because it was it's good the way it was. And the little mistakes or quick movements are often what makes the painting the most interesting and often what really allows the viewer to access the painting is through these little, you could call mistakes, but it's really not what they are. They're just these almost intrusive thoughts. <laughs> and also a lot of it just lies in your muscle memory that you've done it so many times that you don't have to be mentally aware of what you're doing because your hand just knows what to do and your hand is in many ways the best translator of the thoughts to the canvas and I don't I shouldn't interfere with it it's just it's there and it's information I can access it feels like the information is there in my head in my mind I've done it so many times that my head has stored this information and now I can access it without having to think too much and the less I think the better it becomes so I can see in paintings as soon as I start to tremble or doubt it too much or even ask of other people's opinion it, it loses that magic thing that you can't really explain that is often what ends up being the thing that people relate to is that thing you can explain. Which makes a lot of sense, because you're working with emotions and feelings that are often inexplicable. So. In the end, it always depends on who's watching and what context they come from, or they're in, or their mental state, or, you know, so you have to what I find is that you have to work together with the person seeing the work. You have to allow them to have access. And it's a strange word, especially when you're working with figurative painting. I think it can be sometimes a bit of a struggle allowing them that access because you're working with lines and forms that are so strict in many ways and so defined. Um, so I try to allow it to have elements of the abstract, but not abstract as a Pollock or something, but more looser strokes, less defined lines, elements that doesn't really make sense, compositions that are off, 
the more I can get, have that enter the painting, the more I think I open the painting up. And sometimes you also just have to destroy it a little bit so it's not too nice. <laughs> So far, I mostly have faces. I think they're more relatable. Or maybe I'm just not a skilled enough abstract painter. But who knows, maybe they will disappear someday and I'll go full Garrett Richter on it. <laughs> just drop them completely. But I'm not so sure, I think I'll keep them. I think that they're really a key form of expressing a lot of emotions that, you know, it's, it's a kind of a balance I would like to keep because I think the figurative painting can really be more accessible in many ways for people um, and it can be more accessible in the way we think because we, no matter how it's painted, we always see a face in things and we recognize it immediately and we always try and read a face by putting ourselves in the place of the one we're looking at and relating. So I think it's a very good tool in a way for expressing emotions rather than abstract painting. Because abstract painting can do it as well, but it's a little harder making sure that the audience sees what you want them to see. It's more up for interpretation. So the perfect combination would be to have both together. Like a symphony with choir in it or something, with text in it and you have the music. It's, then you make sure that people get it right. But maybe that's just me being a bit stubborn. <laughs> I've experienced many times where people also have very amusing analysis of the work or they see people they shouldn't see and they're all of a sudden it becomes a way different work because they saw someone political or someone else or whatever but it never is the truth but in the end I can't decide what their truth is I can only tell them my intention and then they can decide whether they'll accept it or not if my intention is valid and sometimes, I mean, their reading can be even better than mine because I don't plan my paintings. They don't come out of this big narrative that I want to express. I mean, I have some ideas, I have some thoughts that would be interesting to dive into, but it doesn't come out of this grand philosophical text or anything. I don't refer to any concrete thing. It's more uh, ambiguous than that. And therefore, the reading of it becomes way more ambiguous. I think I'm in a tree. But it's not done yet. But I think I know when a painting is done that when it's very much a feeling that I've filled out the painting, I've put it on the thing that I wanted on it or that I thought about, and it says what it needs to say. Because, I mean, a painting can always be, I mean, can never really be done. You can also overwork a painting and then you just kill the painting, which is what you don't want to do. 
But you can always go and fiddle with some stuff. You can always go and add some things. And I might do that on some of them. But in the end, it's only something I will be able to see. And it'll be done as soon as it's able to communicate what it needs to say. And then, yeah, it might be able to do that without the rest of this filled out. But I'm not so sure. <laughs> In the end, it also depends on how you paint or who's painting, you know? You have different styles. Or some people would have added 10 layers on top of this and only called this the sketch. And some would have done even less to it. You just know. Sometimes, especially if it's a big painting, I'll be looking at it for so long and for so many days that, you know, you get lost, but not in the good way. But you become, I think a better word of saying it is you become blind. You become blind in your own painting. So you can no longer see if it's good or bad or what to do or what not to do. And then it always helps giving it a bit of rest. I mean, sometimes there's also paintings I've done, especially recently. I've done quite a lot of paintings that I'm not... I mean, they're finished paintings. I could see that they were done, and I couldn't do anything more to them. But they weren't necessarily a good painting. And I won't show them. I won't, like... I'll only use them for my own personal archive or study, almost. Because they were just not there but they were, they got to a level where they couldn't go back. And I think I'd overworked them or had just, actually I think I'd trembled a bit too much and became in, too insecure in them. And I could just tell, but I could still tell that the painting was done, but I could also tell that it was not quite there. And so I think it's very important to stay, remain critical of what you do always. But I mean, other people can see them and really like the painting or think that they're great, but it's a, you can't really explain to them why it's not there. Because it looks like a finished painting, but it's, it's just not right. Becoming blind in your painting also happens when I've been focused on a place too much, and then I step back. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks terrible <laughs> in the bigger picture. Because in the end, there's also some, I mean, you're doing tricks in a way. You're manipulating people. You're trying to make them feel things that you want them to feel. And your tools are a brush or this thing, spatula, or, you know, you're like a magician. You have to try and use all your tricks and sometimes that's composition and colors to really try and convey what you want to say or evoke certain things. That's looking okay. I like that part in the middle. the painting a bit, or they often just become restrictive. So when I give them a title, I always give them like an open title. But that almost becomes worse sometimes, because then you're the person who just has like very vague titles. I feel bad every time I call them untitled, because that's a title in itself. It has so many connotations, untitled. But I wish I could just, you know, call them nothing. Nothing. But in the end, someone wants to write it on a plug or write it on a piece of paper. And I understand that it's easier that it has a title, but if that's not, you know, defeats the purpose in a way. So yeah, I think for now it's untitled. 
number five. I don't know. Also, every time I want to give them a title, then I Google it, and that I think that's a mistake. And I end up Googling what I want to call them, and then often there's some weird song called the same time. I have the same title. That's nice. This became a little too icky. Nice. 